Hello, my dear viewer. I want to start this video with words of encouragement to all those who are going through adultery or divorce. My friend, the clouds will surely dissipate and the sun will come out. This is the beginning of your new and better life. All unnecessary people are leaving your life to make room for someone with whom you will be truly happy. And this video is a perfect example. Let's get started. Arthur, it's simple. Just sign the papers and move on. Annie, my wife, with whom we have lived for 25 years, demanded, trying to hear her over a heated argument. The day started normally until I returned home and found her sitting at the table with a stern look and a lonely glass of wine in front of her. She spoke with conviction, and her words became more distant as she continued to rebuke me. As the conversation got more complicated, Annie wasn't sure if I'd like it or if I needed a drink to handle it. I felt that something was wrong as soon as I sat down in the chair. Instead of asking how my day was, she bluntly stated that she was leaving me. Annie found her true love, a man who filled her heart with joy in a way I never could, making me feel inferior. It was hard for me to listen to her when her words were getting louder. The world seemed to be getting more and more silent. Our love story was pretty ordinary. Annie and I crossed paths in high school and went through all the hardships together. Our daughter Sally was born about six months after we tied the knot. Although she wasn't the only reason for our marriage, she was always part of our plan. Currently, we both had stable jobs, although we were not swimming in wealth. I would classify us as middle class. A few years ago, we paid off the mortgage and accumulated a decent amount of capital. We regularly confessed our love to each other. We regularly went on vacation with the whole family, and although our intimate life slowed down compared to the first years of marriage, we still made love on average several times a week. I believed that our love was strong and that we would grow old together until today. Annie's face was flushed with anger and she continued to rant, insisting that I pay attention to her. Arthur, look at me, she demanded. It was hard for me to concentrate, but I turned my gaze to her. You have to sign these papers, she insisted. She gesticulated insistently, pointing at the documents spread out in front of me. Her tone was imperious and insistent. Despite her insistence, it was difficult for me to concentrate. The room seemed dim. The colors turned into a dim blur, although the light in the kitchen was still on. Emotionally, I was worried, but physically, I remained motionless. Since I didn't react in any way, Annie's annoyance only increased. The next moment, she hit me in the face, but I hardly felt the blow, but only imagined what a red mark would remain on my face. I froze in place, watching the world around me slowly sink into darkness. The day dragged on endlessly. Classes at the university were canceled due to some kind of accident. When the power went out, Sally and their entire group were sent home. When she entered the house, her mind went blank. The house was deafeningly silent, except for the faint hum of the light bulbs. The car was parked outside the house, but Annie wasn't there. Entering the kitchen, Sally threw her bag and books on a nearby chair and found me sitting at the table with an unreadable expression on my face. I remained motionless, my gaze turned to the void. There was a half-empty glass and an open bottle of Annie's wine on the table in front of me. There was a stack of papers in front of me with reminders scattered on it. Sign here. Sally came up to me and gently touched my shoulder from behind. Hi, Dad, she said, waiting for an answer. But I couldn't say anything. The words froze in my throat. When she turned my face to her, she was struck by the blank expression in my eyes. I felt a sharp pain in my chest, and it became difficult for me to breathe. Tears flowed down her cheeks. A thin trickle of saliva flowed out of her mouth and dripped onto her knees. Panic rose inside me. Dad, what's wrong with you, Dad? Sally pleaded, tears in her eyes. But I couldn't say anything. I felt myself slowly sinking into darkness. Slow down, Sally, I whispered to myself. Dad needs help. I heard Sally's voice, who dialed the emergency number and disconnected. Sally couldn't understand why, but her mother suddenly decided that she wanted to divorce her father. 
It turned out that the reason for his father's feelings was related to these mysterious documents. When Sally saw the open bottle of wine, it became clear that she had given the documents to her father before leaving him. It's amazing how quickly emotions can change in a situation like this. It was a new experience for many, but for her, all feelings of compassion and affection for her mother seemed to have evaporated. An ambulance soon arrived to carry her father out on a stretcher. Sally recalled how her father was constantly present at all her school events, musicals, and ballet performances. When she tried to learn to play the violin, he patiently endured hours of screeching, always offering words of support. In the end, her father managed to save enough money to buy a violin with the hater sign for her 16th birthday. Although it wasn't the best model, it was significantly superior to her previous training violins. Five more years passed, and Sally went to university, earning a degree in music with a specialization in stringed instruments and violin. Sally waited anxiously, not understanding what was going on, and questions swarmed in her head. Why did father behave like that? Where was my mom? Her confusion only deepened when Sally came across papers labeled Divorce Petition. Shocked and puzzled, she quickly flipped through the document, feeling a chill run down her spine. Sally couldn't understand why, but her mother suddenly decided that she wanted to divorce her father. It turned out that the reason for his father's feelings was related to these mysterious documents. When Sally saw the open bottle of wine, it became clear that she had given the documents to her father before leaving him. It's amazing how quickly emotions can change in a situation like this. It was a new experience for many, but for her, all feelings of compassion and affection for her mother seemed to have evaporated. An ambulance soon arrived to carry her father out on a stretcher. Sally rushed her father to the hospital after finding him unconscious at home. While she was driving behind the ambulance, she made several calls to notify family and friends. Sally contacted her grandmother, her father's mother, his sister Rhonda, and his best friend. In addition, she informed his manager at work about the situation, warning him that his father would have to take a vacation. Sally promised to keep everyone informed of his condition, and his manager assured Sally that he would urgently arrange a vacation for his father. Sally avoided calling her mother out of anger, but she knew she had to talk to her and find out everything. When Annie picked up the phone, she greeted Sally as if nothing had happened and asked how her day had been. It was obvious that Annie realized that something was wrong because it had been almost an hour since Sally found her father in the house in a terrible state. Annie was aware of Sally's schedule, so as soon as it became clear that she was already at home, Annie understood everything. Where are you, Mom? Sally asked rudely. I left Dad. Annie replied. She hesitated, choosing her words carefully. Sally felt the weight of her silence. So, in fact, you left your father, your husband, without thinking? Sally asked. Oh, no, dear. I tried to talk to your father about the field and the situation, but he didn't react in any way, Annie explained. I decided it was time to leave and make it clear that our relationship was over, Annie said. She tried to pretend that nothing terrible had happened, but Sally couldn't shake the feeling that her mother had cruelly broken her father's heart in her absence. How could she leave him when he needed her the most? Was she really that heartless? Do you even realize how much damage you've caused or do you just not care? Sally asked angrily, doubting her mother's actions. Honey, please don't be upset. I understand that this news may be unexpected, but your father will be fine. I just want to ask for what is rightfully mine and for help while Paul and I are waiting for the wedding," Annie said. It looks like you've completely lost touch with reality. Do you think you've seen me angry, Mom? I'm on my way to the hospital now to escort my father who is being taken in an ambulance. It looks like he had a stroke when I got home," Sally said, almost shouting into the phone. Sally, dear, I'm very sorry to hear about this, but... Annie began, but was abruptly interrupted by Sally. To hell with your apologies, Mom. Is this guy Paul, the one you haven't stopped talking about? Are you working with him? Sally asked sharply. 
Annie hesitated before confirming that this was indeed the case. So, he's a lot younger than you, huh? And how long have you been dating him? Sally asked. There was another hesitant pause before Annie admitted that it had been six months. So, you've been having an affair with someone from work for the last six months, and all this time you've been keeping it a secret from your father? Sally concluded with disgust. You deceived Dad and me by hiding your infidelity. I never knew about your infidelity, Mom. And it seems Dad didn't know either, judging by his current condition. Why did you think any of us would approve of this? Sally asked, getting more and more annoyed. Maybe not at first, but as soon as we start living with Paul, you'll realize that we're destined to be together, Annie replied enthusiastically. She mentioned him in the plural again, as if they had been a couple for a long time. Did her mother really think that Sally would leave her father to live with her and her terrible boyfriend? Sally could feel the rage building inside her. She knew that if she didn't calm down, she would definitely say something regrettable. I'm stopping this conversation before I say too much, Sally said firmly. I'll tell you straight out, I will not leave my father and I will never go near that idiot Paul, let alone his house where you and he will live, Sally added with disgust. Annie shouted back, Sally Smith, I'm your mother. I will not tolerate being spoken to in that tone, no matter how upset you are, Annie said. I think our conversation is over, Sally said coldly, and ended the conversation before Annie could respond. If her mother expected Sally to support her actions, she was wrong. Annie tried to call Sally several times, and then she started calling her father's phone. A futile attempt since he hardly answered. Sally had his phone, and he decided to ignore his mother's calls. The father was taken away by an ambulance crew, and now he was in a hospital room under observation. Aunt Rhonda arrived and said that Annie had called her, but she did not know the details, except that her brother was in the hospital. When Sally explained the situation, Aunt Rhonda blushed so much that it seemed like steam was about to come out of her ears. Then she asked if Sally had the documents of her mother, who had left them to her father. Sally assured Rhonda that she had them, because Aunt Rhonda was not only her father's sister, but also a reliable, trustworthy person and lawyer. Rhonda, the family lawyer, joined Sally in the hospital room to review important documents regarding her parents' marriage. As she read the papers and made notes, she did not stop muttering curses under her breath. Within an hour, doctors and nurses regularly looked into the ward to check on the father's condition. Finally, Rhonda broke the hard news. Your mother is planning to divorce your father, she announced solemnly. Judging by the deadlines indicated in the documents, this decision was prepared for more than two months and should have been submitted within a week she added. If she hadn't hired a legal team, the consequences would have been much more expensive for her, Rhonda said. Sally just shrugged, because he had already heard all the excuses her mother could come up with. Despite the fact that Sally has always looked up to her mother, her actions have led to the fact that Sally no longer wants her father to be with her mother. It was a strange feeling, because Sally had never been a daddy's daughter. Paul, Annie's supposed fiancé was the sole culprit behind this heinous act. Despite this, Sally firmly believed that her parents should no longer be together. Rhonda added her thoughts to the conversation. Fortunately, Annie has found a fraud lawyer who is handling her case, which means that she will have to pay a huge amount for the divorce process and even more if the case goes to court, Rhonda said. She couldn't help but smirk at the thought. On the other hand, my brother used the services of the best lawyer in town, who offered him a generous family discount, Rhonda said, winking at Sally. They exchanged smiles, realizing that the situation had changed in their favor. Annie's demands for the division of property in the form of 50% of the value of the house, 60% of financial assets, as well as spousal and child support, seemed excessive and unreasonable. It seems like you don't really like the idea of living with your mother. Judging by your reaction, I assume that you are not going to do this, Rhonda suggested. 
Sally nodded in agreement. Great. The decision has been made. I have a few ideas, but let's wait and see what happens to your father in the next day or so. Your mother may get in hot water for abandoning him, and she may be accused of abuse, Rhonda said. The next few days passed in a blur as doctors diligently monitored Sally's father's condition. Sally was sitting on a hospital chair next to the bed, holding a laptop and a textbook. From time to time, one of the family members would let her go so she could go home, rest, change her clothes, and come back. When Sally was alone at home, she often cried. One of the main surprises was the visit of the owner of the company where her father worked. Sally had never come face to face with his real boss before. To her surprise, it was a woman Tina Williams. She had a sensual and slender figure, tanned skin, dark brown hair and mesmerizing blue eyes that seemed to sparkle, causing men and even some women to faint. It turned out that Sally's father was part of a group at his workplace that supported Tina during a difficult period several years ago. Tina went through a difficult divorce, during which her ex-husband, who cheated on her, tried to take away her daughter and most of their savings. Tina was close to losing half of her business until Sally's father introduced her to Aunt Rhonda, who managed to turn the situation in her favor. Thanks to Rhonda, Tina no longer had to give up part of her business, and she was able to secure alimony payments for their six-year-old daughter. Tina visited the hospital several times and was amazed when she found out the details of what happened and why Arthur was there. Tina brought postcards from Arthur's colleagues, sat by his bedside, held his hand and talked about the work that was being done during his absence. Sally found out that her father was the center of attention at the office party, entertaining everyone with his antics. Despite the fact that he worked as an accountant for a financial company engaged in processing payments for banks, he managed to evoke a sense of joy and energy among colleagues. It was obvious that his presence made the working day a little more enjoyable for everyone. Rhonda and Tina were finishing their conversation, which seemed tense, but it was clear that their displeasure was directed more at Annie than at each other. It turned out that Annie had sent Tina a letter in which she insisted that she be given access to all her husband's bonuses for previous years, despite the fact that the money had already been received. The letter demanded that Tina transfer 50% of the bonuses to the specified bank account within 30 days, or the threat of legal proceedings in case of non-compliance with this requirement. Apart from the absurdity of demanding the money already paid, it seems that she and her new partner are experiencing financial difficulties, since I have frozen all their common property while Arthur is undergoing treatment, Rhonda said with a sly smile. Sally laughed, making her presence known. Yes, this morning, for the first time in two weeks, I received a message from my mother asking for money. I decided not to answer because I'm still offended by her recent behavior, Sally said. Ever since Sally had informed Annie of what had happened to her father, she hadn't been interested in him at all. Lately, Tina has been busy taking care of Sally's father's emotional well-being. Every time Annie was mentioned, Tina's expression would darken and her tone would become more tense, indicating her strong distaste for her. It was as if Sally could see the fierce flame flickering in Tina's eyes. She was afraid that one day Tina and her mother would find themselves in the same room together, and she was afraid that such an intensity of Tina could lead to a catastrophic outcome. Although Sally did not feel deep love for her mother at the moment, she still recognized her as her mother. Despite the fact that Annie played a role in the destruction of a person close to her, she cannot deny their common bond. Sally, I am deeply indebted to your father for his unwavering support during a difficult period of my life. While many in the office offered their help, he stood out by simply listening to me without judging or expressing his own opinion. His patience and understanding helped me get through one of the most difficult moments in my life, and I will always be grateful for his kindness, Tina said. He introduced me to your aunt so that I could be taken care of. If he wasn't busy, I would have tried my best to get him after the divorce, Tina said. Sally just shrugged and let a smile light up her face. Well, 
He's going to be a lonely man soon, Sally remarked. It dawned on them. Rhonda giggled, and Tina smiled. Thank you, Sally. I really needed it. I still can't believe what your mother did to him, Tina said. It was a pity to see how she rejected such a wonderful person. I have to go to work, but first I'll figure out this assignment, Tina said. She went up to Sally's father, and while Sally and Rhonda were watching her, kissed him gently but sincerely on the lips. Tina looked at the women with a smile, but her expression quickly turned to surprise when Sally's father let out a groan. When I came to my senses, I felt soft lips pressing against mine with a gentle effort. When I opened my eyes, I felt that behind the gentle kiss there was a gentle and affectionate intention, which I had not experienced for a very long time. The room was filled with the squeaking of medical equipment, accompanied by my own moans as every muscle in my body ached. Expecting to see Annie standing by my bed, I was surprised to find Tina instead with a smile on her face. My confusion deepened when Sally and Rhonda came over from the other side of the bed, comforting me with words. It's okay, Daddy. Don't worry, everything will be fine, okay? My daughter said. It was only when the memories came flooding back that I realized that Annie had either left me or was going to leave. Sally, what's going on? I croaked as my throat was dry. When they explained to me how Sally found me unconscious and called for help, as well as how she found divorce papers showing Annie's infidelity over the past few years, everything became clear. I found out that Annie threatened Tina after Rhonda took our finances until they found out what was going on with me. When asked how long it would take, Rhonda replied, Two weeks, Arthur. I turned to Tina and asked, Did you kiss me? Tina blushed and confessed, Yes, I'm sorry. I was just going back to the office and wanted to say goodbye. I reassured her, Don't worry, it's okay. I'm already moving forward, so I think we'll be fine. Over the next few hours, I underwent a series of examinations from several doctors, including blood tests and magnetic resonance imaging. Tina decided to cancel her scheduled visit to the office and stayed by my side with Rhonda and Sally. There was a psychologist among the doctors who examined me. I told him about how, when I got home, I found Annie drinking alone and announced her intention to leave me. I also described how, as her emotional outburst grew, the world around me seemed to lose its vividness. The room was plunged into darkness and silence, so it was even difficult for me to move, despite the desire to do so. The last thing I remember is Annie's fist hitting me in the face, and her words, incomprehensible in my stupor, I said softly. The other girls sighed in unison, realizing that Annie had attacked me, and I couldn't fight back. Dad, do you even know what time it all happened? Sally asked urgently. I think it's about 5.30 in the evening, dear. But why would you want to know that? I asked. I came home after 7.30 in the evening and found you there alone. It looks like Mom left you alone for quite a long time, Sally said. A psychologist joined the conversation, explaining that it is not uncommon for people in such circumstances to experience violence when they cannot respond to it. In your situation, it seems you were shocked to learn that your wife was leaving you. Although this is an extreme case, it is not uncommon in our field, the psychologist said. When Arthur was little, he had to face a bully who was much older than him. This bully often teased Arthur, and one day his parents found him lying on the ground in the park. According to his parents, they put him to bed, and the next morning, he woke up as if nothing had happened. It was a strange incident that no one paid much attention to at the time, says Rhonda. I remembered Billy pushing and teasing me in the park. After some confusion, I couldn't remember what happened, but when I came to my senses, my parents informed me that I had lost consciousness, and they found me in the park. After mentioning Billy, my parents immediately talked to his parents. The next day at school, Billy came up to me and asked for forgiveness. I couldn't help but chuckle, doubting his sincerity. But from that moment on, he stopped bothering me. The psychologist explained that despite the advances in understanding the mind, much remains a mystery. 
He suggested that if a similar situation had happened in the past, it could happen again. I furrowed my brows in concern, but he reassured me by smiling. He advised me not to worry too much, because with the support and care of the three kind ladies present here, I will be in safe hands if something happens again. After a short conversation, he said goodbye and left. I felt exhausted too. This may seem strange to someone who has been sleeping for the last two weeks, but I needed a rest. So I sent all three girls home to get some sleep and told them to come back the next day to check on how I was feeling. The next two days rejuvenated me. Tina brought me a work laptop and assigned me some simple tasks to keep my mind occupied. Rhonda also visited me to show me the updated divorce papers. Rhonda convinced me to sign some documents so she could proceed with the dissolution of my marriage to Annie. She brought along a young detective named Karen Hill. Detective Hill asked me in detail about what I went through with Annie that night. After more than an hour of questioning, she thanked me and assured me that we would receive her report in a few days. I wasn't sure if we would file a complaint against Annie, but Rhonda reassured me by saying that everything was in her hands. Before leaving, she kissed me on the forehead, leaving mixed feelings about the whole situation. I was discharged from the hospital the next day, just like Sally said. I was discharged and I was able to return home. Sally was next to me and guided me as we left the building. To my surprise, Tina was waiting for us outside and helped us walk to her spacious SUV. As a result, Tina joined us for dinner that evening. We decided to order a takeaway, and she even helped us with the cleaning. After that, she stayed for a while and watched TV with us. When Tina was about to leave, Sally hugged her warmly. After expressing my gratitude to Tina for her help over the past few weeks, I walked her to her car. Thank you so much for everything you've done. I don't know how I can repay you, I said. Tina grinned and replied, Well, when you feel better in a few weeks, you can invite me to dinner and dancing. Her suggestion made me blush. It was pretty amazing to get out of the hospital in the afternoon and get a date invitation from the same woman whose kiss woke me up in the evening. But she was attractive, and I was on the verge of becoming a bachelor again. After you finish work next Friday night, and I'll have almost two weeks to get back to normal, I suggested. Tina nodded in agreement and then hugged me tightly, and the hug lasted a moment longer than usual, hinting at a deeper meaning. When she left, I couldn't help but smile fleetingly at the thought that I hadn't divorced the woman I'd been married to for almost 25 years, and I was already dating. In the days that followed, Sally, Rhonda, and Tina continued to take care of me, showing their concern and concern. It was nice that my daughter and I were being taken care of so well. But the news that Rhonda shared with me on Friday afternoon took us all by surprise. Annie was arrested this afternoon, she informed me. Curious, I asked, what happened? Rhonda explained that after my statement to the police, a warrant was issued at the hospital for Annie's arrest on charges of mental cruelty towards a person in a bad emotional state. This was established on the basis of the evidence presented. At the moment when I was immobilized and couldn't protect myself, she left me unattended and without help for an unknown amount of time, and she's in big trouble. This situation could have serious consequences for our divorce proceedings. Tina, who joined us for dinner again, took her eight-year-old daughter Clarissa with her that evening. While we were talking, Clarissa was watching a Disney movie in the living room. As I was preparing to return to work on Monday, Tina said she would meet me there to discuss our situation. I began to realize that something more was required of her than just the ability to work effectively with numbers in the office. I couldn't help but wonder what was hidden under the amazing tight clothes that Tina always wore when she came to visit. Rhonda chuckled suggesting that some things would probably work in my favor. Considering the bank accounts and the state of the house, I was in favor of dividing everything equally. Despite everything that happened, I tried to be fair and honest. Rhonda nodded in agreement. Annie's attempt to gain access to the bonus money you mentioned will be stopped. I sued her for extortion and mental pressure. 
While this may prevent her from gaining access to assets that are not rightfully hers, it likely won't have a lasting impact on her. Most likely, in a few days, she will be released, and she will be able to reunite with her betrothed. My goal is to speed up the divorce process by taking advantage of the sick leave, said Rhonda. After that, I have plans depending on her reaction. I'll make sure that you don't lose anything superfluous, Arthur, Rhonda added with a smile. So, Aunt Rhonda, how long do you think the divorce will take? Sally asked. I think everything is going smoothly. It should be completed in about three months. If Annie decides to resist, I will use heavy artillery, and it may take longer, but it will definitely be more painful for her, Rhonda said. In the evening, I walked Tina to her car. Sally helped Clarissa into the back seat, and Tina hugged me and pressed a short and unexpected kiss to my lips. It brought back memories of how I woke up the day before. Arthur, Tina began, I understand that you are married and appreciate honesty so I won't push too hard. But now I have to confess my feelings for you. I've wanted you for a long time, but I would never show these feelings to a married man or be the reason for breaking someone's vows. I've been through this before. I don't want anyone else to experience this, even if their marriage is falling apart, Tina added. I looked into her beautiful dark blue eyes, brushed a lock of dark brown hair from her face, and then bent down to kiss her. What started as a soft and gentle kiss quickly turned into a passionate embrace that lasted, as it seemed to me, 30 seconds. At that moment, I felt a strong connection with her. When I finally pulled away, Tina's eyes were closed and she ran her tongue over my lips, savoring the moment we shared. I smiled, confirming my rights. We looked at the girls who were giggling as they watched us kiss. Clarissa was clapping her hands and Sally was grinning broadly. When Tina and Clarissa left, Sally hugged me tightly and we headed into the house, feeling happy. The following months were like riding a roller coaster. Annie wanted to get a divorce as soon as possible, but at the same time she was unhappy with the agreement. It turned out that Paul was in control of the situation, advising her to take most of the assets. He was feeding her lies, and deep down she must have realized that after so many years of marriage. As the settlement demands became increasingly unreasonable, Rhonda contacted Annie's lawyer. Whatever was discussed during this conversation, all objections to the settlement agreement suddenly disappeared. Tina and I started seeing each other every Friday night, with Sally looking after Clarissa, taking her to our house. Tina and I finally have free time to have dinner, drink coffee, watch a TV series, or even go dancing. Despite the fact that we only held hands and exchanged kisses, I had a feeling that our evening after the divorce would be special. When we returned to work, everything seemed to be going smoothly. Working in a financial institution, we made a decent profit, not exactly in the top league, but we all did our job well and received decent remuneration for it. In general, we were perfect for each other. The staff began to notice that Tina and I were getting closer, perhaps becoming a couple. Although everyone seemed to be supportive of our relationship, I had to be more restrained in my usual behavior. My immediate boss, who reported to Tina, made it clear that our personal relationship should not be discussed at work, especially since I, in fact, met with his boss. About three and a half months later, we were informed that the divorce from Annie would be finalized next Thursday. She asked for a meeting to discuss everything before making a final decision, and I accepted the invitation. We agreed that she would come to the house to talk to Sally and me. I took the day off to cook chops, dumplings, and gravy, a favorite dish of all of us. I was hoping it would help relieve the tension during our evening conversation. Sally arrived home around 5.30 in the evening, took a quick shower, and changed her clothes. Shortly before 6, the doorbell rang, and Annie appeared on the threshold. Up to this point, I had not gone into the details of Annie's appearance. But maybe it's time to paint a picture. Before the chaos that happened a couple of months ago, Annie was an amazing housewife in her 40s. Her hair was a rich brown shade and fell just below her shoulders. Despite a few extra pounds, 
She had the hunched physique of a mother, which was undeniably attractive. With her ample bust and perfectly proportioned bottom, Annie certainly attracted attention. But now, when I looked at this woman, it was obvious that something had changed in her. Annie looked almost unrecognizable. She gained a lot of weight, and plump cheeks appeared on her face. Her once slightly protruding belly now hung over her trousers, and her mother's figure had become plump and lop-eared. She wore baggy clothes, trying to hide her new size. Although I don't mind big women, it was a radical change for Annie. Surprise must have shown on my face because Annie flinched, but didn't say anything. Hi, Annie, come in. I greeted her, letting her into the kitchen. I poured her a glass of wine, which she accepted with pleasure. We had a light conversation about nothing for a few minutes. Annie was interested in my work and my well-being, and in response I asked about her work. I decided not to say anything about her appearance, but she figured it out on her own. Paul was concerned about my weight and encouraged me to gain it, Annie said. She brought up this unspoken question, causing me to furrow my brows in response. I have loved this woman for more than 25 years, despite the pain she caused me. Even now I still care about her well-being. You may not understand, but I can't help but worry about her health. I turned to her and confessed, Annie, I can't deny it. When we were together, you were in great shape and healthy. But I have to say that I'm worried about your current appearance. You don't look healthy. If it hadn't hurt me from what happened between us, I would have been genuinely worried about you and wanted to help. But you're indifferent, aren't you? Asked Annie. Her expression dropped. You and Sally are happy and thriving without me, she added bitterly. There's a part of me that's feeling a little uneasy. But when you left and basically left me to suffer, I brushed it off, I said. She sighed resignedly. I probably deserved it. I did a terrible thing, didn't I? Annie asked. No, Mom, Sally interjected, getting out of the shower. You did a really terrible thing. You destroyed a once happy family and then left without thinking, the daughter added harshly. I don't understand why Dad agreed to let you in here tonight, Sally said in disbelief. Sally, please try to calm down. Mom knows what a difficult situation we are in and how unhappy we all are. It must have been hard for her to come here. She asked for this meeting herself, and I thought we should at least be mature and listen to her, I said. Sally was clearly upset. As far as I understand, she, like me, has not spoken to her mother since that fateful day. There was tension in the room as I watched my daughter's piercing gaze directed at her mother. It was clear that the situation was on the verge of exploding, so I decided it was better to shift the focus. Putting on a facade of cheerfulness, I invited everyone to start the dinner I had prepared. While we were eating, the room fell silent, and only the family members cast cautious glances at each other. Sally stared at her mother unwaveringly. After dinner, I started clearing the table, and Annie quietly asked for a private conversation with Sally. Tell Dad whatever you want in front of me, but I won't leave you alone with him, Sally said firmly. I was stunned by Sally's firm stance in refusing to leave me alone with my mother. Annie seemed to understand, too. Her expression mirrored that of her mother on that fateful night with me. Annie nodded before taking a deep breath. It was clear that she didn't want to have this conversation in front of me, but she directed her words at Sally. Sally, I have to apologize for my actions that night. Now I understand that I did everything wrong, Annie said bitterly. I don't want to be separated from my daughter indefinitely no matter what happens, Annie said, looking at me. There's something else I need to talk to you about, but I'd rather do it alone, away from your father. Annie said, looking at her daughter. I'm sorry, Mom, but if you can't tell us both, I don't want to know anything, Sally said. With that, Sally got up and left before Annie could do or say anything else. A minute later, the sound of her bedroom door slamming was heard. I wanted everything to go smoothly, Annie whispered. More for her benefit than for mine, I said that the conversation went pretty smoothly. Really? Annie asked, wanting to make sure of it. 
Yes, indeed, I replied with a sigh. Annie, it's important for you to understand that people in this house don't particularly like you at the moment, I added. Before she could answer, I raised my hand to stop her. Let me explain the situation. First of all, you had a long-term intimate relationship with a man who treated you badly, and then you kept it a secret from both Sally and me, I began. Suddenly you brought me the divorce papers, and I was speechless. While I was digesting this blow, you flared up with anger and hit me, I said. Annie's expression was like that of a frightened deer. The memories of that conflict situation remained in my memory until the moment when you resorted to cruelty. But the story didn't end there. You left me in a state of shock until Sally came home and discovered my broken state, I said bitterly. Fear appeared on Annie's face. When Sally contacted you, you showed a lack of concern for me, even though your daughter is clearly worried about me. Until tonight, you have never asked about my health. You made unreasonable demands on my employer, and when you entered the room, all attention was still focused on you. Although you asked Sally for forgiveness, you never apologized to her, I said. I paused for a moment, hoping that my message would resonate with her. Overall, Annie, I think the conversation went smoothly despite everything that was said, I concluded. Annie's eyes filled with tears and she stared at the floor. The tears hadn't fallen yet, but they were already on the verge of shedding. I couldn't tell if it was tears for Sally for myself or just a reflection of her own pain. I continued, breaking the heavy silence between us. So our divorce will be finalized tomorrow? I asked with humility in my voice. If there's nothing else to discuss, then I think our last meeting has come to an end. With a heavy heart, I went to the door and opened it. Annie met my gaze, then turned and walked away, leaving me alone with the echoes of our broken relationship. When she crossed the threshold, she turned to face me. Arthur, we've had some great years together, haven't we? She said. Yes, Annie. Most of our time together has been incredible, I replied. You were a fantastic lover, a devoted wife, and a caring mother. I don't know what that fool Paul did to you, but I no longer see the woman I fell in love with when I look at the man standing in front of me. All I see is a man who has been led astray and tricked into seeking senseless gain, I said bitterly. Annie stared at the ground, her heart heavy. You really think so, don't you, Arthur? She asked, not wanting to hear the answer. I confirmed it and she felt like a part of her soul was torn apart. As she turned to leave, Annie couldn't help but turn around one last time. But this time, there was a look of defeat in her eyes. Arthur, about the house and the money, she began, feeling the bitterness rising in her throat. Paul said I should ask. And then it dawned on me. I realized that this visit was not to reunite with my family. It's all about the damn money. Annie looked at me, puzzled by my laughter. I told her to inform her partner that by this time tomorrow she would receive her share of the savings and capital from the house, which were transferred to a bank account managed by her lawyer Rhonda. I warned Annie to be careful and keep the money away from Paul, as he might not let her keep it for long. The next morning marked the official end of my marriage to Annie. It was a bittersweet moment for me, as a small part of me felt sad. But overall, I was overwhelmed with a sense of relief and freedom. The last few months have been difficult for both of us, but at the age of 48, I knew that I still had a lot of life ahead of me. In the evening, Rhonda called and invited me to her house for pizza. During lunch, Sally dropped by the office, and we thought about happier times when we were still a family, talked about her mother and shared our memories. Sally may not have loved her mother deeply, but she definitely longed for the woman she once knew. To tell you the truth, neither do I. We have lived together for many happy years. When Sally left, it became clear that there was some kind of connection between her and Tina, because soon after that I was called to Tina's office. After closing the door behind me, she kissed me passionately, as if the end of the world had come, and to be honest, I returned the kiss with no less fervor. Can I call you mine now, Arthur? She whispered. She whispered. Dinner that evening was pleasant and was held in the company of Sally, Rhonda, Tina, and Clarissa, 
as we celebrated my newfound freedom from Annie. Later on Friday evening, Tina and I took our platonic relationship to a new level in the privacy of our bedroom. It looks like I did something right, because the rest of the weekend was filled with happiness and satisfaction. Tina and I couldn't keep our hands off each other. Our every night was filled with burning passion. Six months later, we exchanged vows in a beautiful ceremony at a nearby lake, surrounded by colleagues and friends. Although we had originally planned to wait, we decided to tie the knot before Sally and Clarissa's younger brother was born. It's been five years since Sally and her boyfriend and Tina and I enjoyed dinner at one of the nearby restaurants. Suddenly, five-year-old Keegan innocently asked, Dad, what kind of woman is looking at us? We all turned around and saw Annie sitting at the next table. She had lost a lot of weight and looked unhappy. It's been years since we last saw her or heard from her after the divorce. She never tried to contact Sally. Feeling responsible, I apologized to the family and decided to approach Annie. Hi, Annie, I said. Hello, Arthur, she replied softly. How are you? I asked. Annie stared at her plate of chicken salad as she spoke. You were right, Arthur. You were right about him. Paul made me believe that I was his true love and that you meant nothing to me. But when you didn't give me the money in advance, Paul started pushing me to gain weight, claiming that he loves me and loves bigger women. After the divorce, when I finally got the money, you warned me not to give it to him. But I didn't listen, Annie began bitterly. Paul quickly spent all the money in just a couple of months and then left me without getting married. I felt hurt and betrayed. After that, I spent all my strength trying to restore the self-confidence he had destroyed and rediscover my old self, Annie said. She was fighting back tears as she looked at me, and for the first time in years I saw the familiar regret in her eyes. Arthur, I'm so sorry. I treated you terribly, Annie whispered, almost crying. I made this decision because I believed that Paul had knowledge that you didn't know about. I left the only person who ever showed me true love and... Annie paused, gripping the table tightly. My actions could have led to your death. I understand that you may never be able to forgive me, but I want to express my deep remorse, she said. Tears were falling freely from her eyes. To my surprise, Sally came and stood next to me, having also listened to her mother's apologies. I looked at her, and she smiled wearily, taking my hand in hers. Perhaps for the first time, she realized that her mother was genuinely remorseful. When her mother's gaze softened, she held out her hand. Stunned by Sally's unexpected gesture, Annie tried to run away, but Sally blocked her way. Mom, please, you don't have to leave, Sally urged, sitting in the booth next to Annie, and I took a seat on the other side. Glancing at Tina, I saw that she gave a barely perceptible nod of approval. And so for the next hour, we sat together in silence. Emotions overwhelmed us. The mother and daughter had a heartfelt conversation filled with numerous reconciliations and tears, which, oddly enough, were constructive rather than destructive. After the conversation, Sally and I sat Annie down at the table to introduce her to the rest of the family. It was noticeable that Annie was stunned when Keegan called her Aunt Annie. From that moment on, we began to gradually bring Annie back into our lives, allowing Sally to gradually rebuild her relationship with her mother. They met for a cup of coffee every week or two, and with each meeting their trust in each other grew deeper. Sally's wedding brought them even closer together, and Annie began to play the role of the bride's mother. Despite the fact that Tina initially invited Annie to dinner out of spite, their relationship developed into a strange but inexplicable friendship. Rhonda never forgave Annie for her actions towards me, although she remained cordial at all intersections. With Tina's approval, Annie and I sought post-marital counseling to resolve issues that had arisen more than five years ago. During the sessions, we delved into many of the problems we faced, and the consultant suggested that one of the contributing factors could be hormonal imbalance. Despite this, Annie did not acknowledge the existence of any potential problems. That day, I made a decision that ultimately cost me everything I cherished. 
A loving husband and a daughter who wanted to be with me so much, Annie told the psychologist. I can't blame my hormonal imbalance for making a disastrous choice that ended up destroying all the good things in my life. I allowed myself to be manipulated by a man who whispered false promises in my ear, who had neither character nor physical abilities. When I realized how I had let Arthur and Sally down, who deserved so much more from me, it was a wake-up call, says Annie. When tears welled up in her eyes, she confessed, it took me five long years to finally make amends and restore relations with them. I spent five years away from them, mired in my own mistakes. But every day I thank God that Arthur allowed me to return to his life. Tina also surprised me with her warm welcome, despite the fact that she had every reason to hate me. She was lucky. She got what I threw away, and I will regret it for the rest of my days, Annie said bitterly. Annie was most helped by our meetings with a psychologist. It was nice to know that neither Sally nor I were to blame for her leaving us. Tina was right. She united us and strengthened our family. They say that in the end, people face the consequences of their mistakes. And so it happened with Paul. After moving to another state, he again tried to molest a married woman and her finances. But this time, the husband caught Paul doing this and took drastic measures, leaving him unable to have intimacy. Her husband was sentenced to 10 years in prison, but there are rumors that he may be released soon, as suggested by Rhonda, who is now his representative. Tina and I love each other deeply and deeply. I never thought that I could love someone as much as Annie, but Tina proved the opposite to me. She not only gives me her love, but her whole soul, without hesitation. We both work for the same company, and I kept my old job. Despite the difficulties, open communication is a priority in our relationship. Tina's beauty still fascinates me, and we continue to share intimate moments often. During the holidays, we indulged in romantic meetings in exotic places. All I had to do was watch, close the bedroom door, and we made love. One day, when we were getting ready, we went into the kitchen and found Sally and Annie there, deep in conversation. We found out that Sally was pregnant, and there was excitement in the room. The girls were happy to plan the arrival of my first grandchild. It was funny to see how young and enthusiastic they were, as if they were teenagers again. Tina, you have to tell me what you're feeding Arthur. Maybe I can use some of this to feed Fred, Annie jokingly asked Tina. Mom, what are you talking about? Sally said, laughing. I noticed that my father's interest in romance novels increased as his libido suddenly tripled, Annie said with a mischievous twinkle in her eyes, causing us all to burst out laughing. Tina blushed, Sally laughed, and I just sat there and grinned at my girls. At the sight of Tina, I felt a familiar surge of desire and felt myself getting aroused again. I got up and went into the bedroom and Tina followed me. When she closed the bedroom door behind her, I realized that I had definitely been noticed. 